Hello, and welcome to lecture 21 on the topic of reflection and refraction. This is our first lecture on the topic of ray optics. Since lecture 17, we've been talking about light that began our unit on light, having concluded electricity and magnetism. But lectures 17, 18, 19, and 20 were all about wave optics and exploring how light behaves as a wave. But now, we don't care about the properties of light as a wave. Instead, we just care about how it bounces around. So let's then get into the ideas of reflection and refraction. We have a few objectives. We want to continue our investigation of light, certainly, and consider light as not just an EM wave, but also as a particle and a ray. Now, as far as the particle bit, that's really going to be a little bit later, so don't worry about it too much. We also want to learn the law of reflection, just clearly what is it, and learn, learn Snell's law and how it arrived at how it's arrived at from the change in speed of light in materials. So a bit of an, an explanation of its derivation. Well, let's get right into our key terms. Now, before I do so, I just want to give a little technical note here. Due to a computer crash, I'm going to be presenting these notes slightly differently. It'll be very similar, but the way I reveal the formulas in, and so forth will be in larger chunks. So if you're used to my normal lecture format, you might notice a little change, but again, quite similar. Okay, so let's get into the light ray as our first key term. Well, it represents, let me zoom in a bit, it represents the path of light. Okay, so it just shows where light is pointing. So if we consider something like maybe a candle here, there are rays emanating from that candle. Now there are an infinite number of them in a light source like a candle, the rays go in all directions. If we consider something like a laser, we can approximate that laser as a single ray because it's more unidirectional. Okay, so those are the rays. And perpendicular to the rays are the actual wave fronts. So there is an idea because of course the light is spreading out as a wave, maybe it's diffracting as it spreads out. But the point being is that the direction is represented by a ray, all right? And that's gonna be our primary focus. It's mostly used for prisms, which we'll see quite a bit in this, this lecture, mirrors and lenses to show where light is directed, okay? And it's an abstract idea. There's not really any such a thing as a light ray that is only concerned with macroscopic light behavior. So rays definitely ignore the wave behavior and the particle behavior, right? We already know what can happen with waves in terms of interference patterns, um, or even, you know, just interference in general. And we'll see more about particles and times where light distinctly behaves like a particle in later lectures. Okay, so there we have the idea of a light ray. Now let's look at the first of our two laws, the law of reflection. Okay, so the law of reflection, of reflection states that the angle of reflection must be the same as the angle of incidence. Okay, so we have two equal angles. If something comes in at a certain angle, it gets bounced back at the same angle. Okay, and these angles are typically measured relative to the normal of the reflected surface. All right, the normal direction just being perpendicular to the surface. Okay, so we'll see some pictures of that and some applications of it in just a couple moments. Our other law is Snell's law. All right, this is the law of refraction. Okay, so if we've got reflection, a word we know, you know, bouncing something off, then there's also refraction. This might not be a word that you see in other contexts. And what refraction means is the bending of light. In everyday terms, that's what refraction means. It means that light has bent. Okay, and Snell's law is the law that refers to that bending. Okay, it states that when light travels from one medium to another, now medium here, we could interchange that word of material, right? But medium may be like air to glass or air to water, okay? To another, okay, with a different index of refraction. Now this term index of refraction, where have we seen that before? Well, we saw that in lecture 17, for example, okay? That was, that was the first time it was showed up in key terms. So it's a good, if you wanna to refer to what the index of refraction is, you can certainly see that there. You also see it highlighted in the examples here when we put it to practice. In short, refraction is all about light slowing down through transparent materials other than a vacuum, okay? So the light bends based on the ratio of the refractive indices. Okay, so that's the idea. There's, there's, a, there's a defined amount of bending and it's always set by the ratio of refractive indices, okay? So a neat way to think about it is light bends towards the normal direction, so towards the normal, when entering a material with higher refractive index, okay? So essentially, it's taking the shorter path when it's moving more slowly. So if you go from a vacuum, where light's moving at its maximum speed, okay, it's true speed, and then it enters a transparent material, then it, it's going to turn towards the direction of kind of getting through that transparent material as quickly as possible. Now, that's not really what the light's doing, but that's one helpful way of thinking about it. Okay, so you go, light slows down, it bends towards just the, the more direct path, okay? All right, 
So what's real neat about both the law of reflection and Snell's law is that they can be explained using Huygens' principle, okay? So we're gonna apply them to reflection and refraction. All right, so Huygens' principle, which was mentioned in the previous lecture in order to justify, no, excuse me, but in order to justify the diffraction pattern from a single slit, in order just to, to explain diffraction itself, is a principle that says that all wave fronts, now you have a little bit of wave, wave ideas, but all wave fronts are composed of an infinite number of wave sources that all produce their own wavelets, and then those wavelets superimpose to make the next wave front. Now the reason we, we, would, we, would do, we would consider this is because of course now we know there's a ray that runs perpendicular to all those wave fronts. Okay, again, an abstract idea. So then we should be able to explain the rays of light here and their reflection and refraction according to the aforementioned laws using this principle of little wave sources and wavelets. In other words, Huygens principle. Okay, so it's, it's, it's really neat because Huygens principle can be used to explain diffraction. We just saw that in lecture 20, and now we're using it to explain reflection and refraction. So very encompassing principle. Okay, so here, let's take a look at the figures. All right, so I wanna just zoom in at both, at both of them individually. This one here represents refraction. That's the bending of light going from one material to another, one medium to another. This figure here represents reflection off of an angled mirror. Okay, so what's going on with the two? Well, if we look here, we have a ray, right? Here's our ray. Our ray is coming down at a certain angle relative to the normal, that would be theta A, okay? Then it passes through the material. So this is this material down below is, is transparent, okay? And as such, the light continues to pass through it, but now the light's moving at a different speed due to the refractive index of the transparent material. And that means it's gonna have a different angle relative to the normal direction, okay? But that's just me saying it so. Why should it be so? Well, let's consider, all right? So the velocity in the transparent material is less than the velocity in what we can assume to be air. And that's because the index of refraction of the transparent material is greater than that of air. And that means that the velocity slows down, okay? Whenever you go to anything with a greater refractive index, like glass with maybe a refractive index of 1.4, then the velocity of light within glass is gonna be the speed of light in the vacuum, 300 millimeters per second, divided by 1.4. It'll be that much slower, okay? So if it's slower, then that's going to affect the wavelength. Because let's look at the distance between wave fronts. So this blue line here is a wave front, and the distance to the next wave front is the velocity in the vacuum, velocity A, times the period of the wave. Okay, so T is the period, the frequency is one over the period, and they don't change, okay? So the frequency and the period never change. When light travels from one material to another, those particular properties of the light don't change. So if they don't change, what does change? Lambda changes, okay? Because since we have a new velocity, an idea we've already established as we go into these materials with different refractive indices, as we have a new velocity, but the same period, at this, right? That new smaller velocity times the same period of the wave is gonna give us a shorter wavelength because the velocity is shorter, okay? And another way to think about that change in wavelength is this right here, okay? Okay, so that's all fine. That, that just explains why the wavelength changes and what's held constant. In other words, the period and the frequency of the wave. But how does that then cause the light to bend? We'll consider the little sources. Okay, these are the sources that the wavefront is composed of, an infinite number of them. And as we look, these sources create what are called, again, wavelets, okay? That's treating each one as a point source, just like the two point sources in double, double slit interference. Well, then when we look where all those wavelets are going to constructively interfere, they create the new composite wavefront, the wavefront that runs perpendicular to the new ray. All right, and we see because of that shortened wavelength, the wave fronts lag, pulling the ray closer to the normal direction. All right, so we see it just comes directly out of drawing the appropriately length wavelengths compared to the original wavelength. In other words, the shorter wavelengths. Okay, all right. So that's that's refraction. For reflection, it's quite a bit easier because there's not much change but we can apply the same ideas. We can say that the velocity A equals B, because the velocity would be the velocity of the wave coming in, probably in air, so you know full speed, right? And then after it reflects off the surface, it's going to be moving at the same speed, 
All right, so there is no change in velocity in this case, but there still are, or still is, a wave front shown here. Right, here's the wave front, and that wave front is composed of many sources, right, an infinite number of sources, but we're showing some example sources here. Each of those sources create a wavelet, and then those wavelets superimpose to create the new wave front through their constructive interference, okay? So then we look, well, what is the wavelength? It's VAT. And after reflection, it's VBT. But I just said that V equals VB because there was no change in the medium. That means that the wavelength is unchanged, no change in the index, the um, you know refractive index. Okay, well then when we look at that, that means that what happens, what has to happen is equal angles, all right? It just comes right out of the geometry of having the same length radii, okay? All right, so a couple of just uh, summarizing in words below. Every point, and this is Huygens principle, all right, every point on the wave front is the source of wavelets that have a wavelet that have wavelet wave fronts with the spacing of lambda, which is the velocity of the wave times a period, or the velocity of the wave divided by the frequency. The superposition of all the wavelet wave fronts create the wave from um, well, wave for the entire ray. Okay, and we see that these created wave fronts are consistent with the laws of reflection and refraction. Okay. All right. Now you might be like, well, consistent in what, what sense? Well, indeed, when we went from lower to higher um, reflective or refractive index, the light bent towards the normal direction. Okay. And this black line is the normal direction. Okay. The angle, the angle got smaller. Okay. Now, um, I guess an another thing to consider about that is let's see the law itself. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at the key equations. Okay. All right. So here are all the key equations. We got the law of reflection. We got the, if I zoom out a bit, the law of refraction. Okay, so let's first look at the law of reflection. Not too much to say here. It just says that the angle of reflection, which is theta one prime, equals the angle of incidence, just the incoming angle. So in picture form, here's the normal direction pointing perpendicular to the reflective surface, and here are the two equal angles. Okay, very good. Here is just the refractive index defined again for convenience it being equal to the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in some medium. All right, another way to think about the refractive index is it's equal to the ratio of the wavelength of light in a vacuum, measured in meters, to the wavelength of light in the medium, also measured in meters. And then finally, the actual law of refraction, Snell's law. It says that N1 multiplied by sine theta one equals N2 multiplied by sine theta two. Okay, there's the law. N1 is the refractive index of medium one. Theta one is the angle with the normal in material one. N2 is the refractive index of medium two. And theta two is the angle with the normal in material two. All right, so there we see how they're equal to each other, right? So it's that these two products are equal to each other. Okay, and here's what it looks like. Here is the normal direction, medium one, medium two, and here are the angles. In this case, since theta two is smaller than theta one, that tells us that N2 must be greater than N1. And that's an idea that certainly we'll put to practice and hopefully you'll become very familiar with. Okay, so let's start off our practice with doing some concept questions. Okay, so let's take a look at concept question one. As the angle of incidence is increased for a ray incident on a reflecting surface, the angle between the incident and reflected rays ultimately approaches what value? Okay, well, here's the idea, right? Here's that that incident angle is a reflected angle. And the idea is we're gonna increase the incident angle. We're gonna make it you know, more and more obtuse, right? So it's a kind of just grazing the surface. It approaches 180 degrees. Because if the angle, if the ray and the angle of the ray relative normal was, you know, was so steep and that angle was so close to 90, then like I said, it would almost just graze the surface and you'd have 180 degrees, okay? All right, question two is all about refraction. And we'll, we'll do, there's not too many practice problems really for reflection. That's why I'm getting right into refraction. Although we will do a couple of simple examples, numerical ones on the next page. Okay, so question two. When light travels from air into water, what happens to the following properties of light? And we know some of this from previous lectures, like lecture 17, for example, but it's good to review because this idea of refractive changes is so front and center, center to this very lecture. All right. So the idea is that the refractive index of water is greater than air. It's something on the order of 1.33 for water, typical value, and certainly that's greater than one. So the speed is decreased, okay? Slows down, light effectively slows down when it enters water, okay? Now the wavelength is decreased, 
right? We know why, right? Because there's, there's, you know, it takes less time because it's the same period. So that wavefront travels less distance, okay? So the wavelength is decreased. There's no change in the frequency and there's no change in the energy because the energy is dependent entirely on the frequency. Okay, cool. And no change in the period, as we just said on the previous page. Okay, question three. A laser beam passing from medium one to medium two, right? So from one to two is refracted as shown. What must be true about the index of refraction of the two mediums? Hmm, let's see. So one thing to consider is theta two is larger than theta one. So that means that our refracted ray has actually bent away from the normal. Now, typically when you're traveling from air to something else, or maybe I should say, typically you tra light is traveling from air into something. That's just such a very common problem, right? You're shining light on a piece of glass. In that case, the light came from air and it goes into the glass. But sometimes the light might have started inside the glass or underwater and go, goes up into air. Well, in those cases, then, well, you would see a situation like this. Because what's happened is N1 is greater than N2. We've gone from higher to lower indices of refraction. Okay, And we can, we can tell that because the ratio of N2 over N1 is equal to the ratio of, their, of the, the signs of the opposite. All right, let's see how they're switched like so. And that just comes from Snell's law. And that's greater than 1. And if it's greater than one, then we know that the, that inequality must be true. Okay. All right, let's do some numerical problems, starting off nice and simple. And by the way, there's only two types of problems here in these notes. Um, they're they're color coded, but uh, not uh, not in these parts, right? Again, just a little little uh, error. But there's two types, and there's two problems that are going to refer to reflection, and the, the rest refer to refraction. Oh, and there's also one that refers to creating simple images from refraction. And I'll talk about why that's a different type of problem when we get there, all right? But these first two examples, example one and example two, are simple problems that have to do with reflection, okay? So example one, a full length mirror on a closet door is two meters tall. The bottom touches the floor. A bare light bulb hangs one meter from the closet door, 0.5 meters above the top of the mirror. How long is the streak of reflected light across the floor, okay? So we wanna know this length, okay? So here's the idea. First of all, we're going to find the angle theta. And we're going to find it from the spatial geometry because we have a, we know that this triangle is similar to that triangle. In other words, it has equal proportion sides. And so then we can say that then tangent theta, opposite over adjacent, is just going to be 0.5 over 1. So then if we solve for theta taking tangent inverse of 0.5 over 1, we get 26.6 degrees. Then, since we don't know L, but we do know that side of the triangle, we'll use tangent theta again for our known angle to simply set it up like this, solve for L, and then find that it's four meters long. Very good, all right? And we could have just reasoned out that it's the same ratio, that it has to be twice as long. In other words, the ratio of 0.5 to 1 is 2, as 2 must be to L at four meters, okay? All right, so a very simple problem using the law of reflection. This next one has a bit more going on, but not too much. Two plane mirrors meet at a 135 degree angle. If light rays strike one mirror at 35 degrees, as shown right there, at what angle phi does light leave the second mirror? So we wanna find this angle, okay? So here's the picture. We know this angle right here, theta, is 135 degrees. We were told that, okay? And we know that this makes a triangle and all triangles sum to 180 degrees. And we know that this angle right here must be 34 degrees. How do we know that? From the law of reflection. Therefore, in order to find this angle on the edge of the triangle, which I'll call phi, and you, you probably know why I'm calling it phi, we simply have to use this formula here and then solve for phi. So phi is just 180 minus 135 minus 34 or 11 degrees, which it does look like a small angle, so that makes sense, right? And this picture is more or less drawn on the scale. And note that we use the law of reflection twice. The first time was to set these two 34 degree angles equal to each other. And of course, the second time was when I acknowledged that this phi must be the same as that phi. Okay, so there we go. That was our answer, phi is 11 degrees. Very good, all right. So now let's move on to problems that involve refraction because there's a bit more going on there. Okay, so if a beam of light enters a transparent material from air and is seen to turn towards the normal direction by five degrees, then what must be the index of refraction of that material, okay? So how do we set this up? Well, here we have that the change in angle is five degrees, the delta theta is five degrees. And the easiest way to choose this is just to choose an arbitrary theta one. So say 45 degrees. Then write out Snell's law, the law of refraction, ref refraction, excuse me, and solve for the, the 
indice of refraction, the index of refraction um, for the material that the light is traveling into, okay? So from air. Well, we know that since it came from air, N1 is just one, all right, as you can see here. And we're just gonna put in our angles because we know that there was a change of five degrees. It had to be a decrease, okay? It has to be a decrease from Huygens' principle, okay? So then we know if we went from 45, then the final angle must be 40. So then we just have one times the ratio of sine 45 over 40, which find that gives us, or lets us find out that the index of refraction of a transparent material is 1.1, all right? It's always gonna be greater than one, obviously. All right, so that's the idea. And if I had chosen a different angle, I would have gotten the same answer, all right? Because the ratio is what matters. Okay, very good. Let's go on to our next example. Okay, an oil film floats on a water surface. Okay, so oil and water, and that, that's of course the case. That if oil is less dense than water, it doesn't mix. The indices of refraction for water and oil, respectively, are 1.333 and 1.466. If a ray of light is incident on the air to oil surface with so the top at an angle of 41.9 degrees with the normal, what is the ray angle at the oil to water interface? So it's at the bottom of the oil, all right? And if the oil has a thickness of one millimeter, then how many full wavelengths of light fit within the oil if we take the wavelength of the light to be 510 nanometers, which we'll assume will be the wavelength in a vacuum. So of course we'll account for the wavelength within the oil. So here's the picture, okay? So we have three indices of refraction to consider. We've got the air with the index of refraction of one, we've got the oil, and then we've got the water underneath, okay? So what's gonna happen is the light is gonna bend twice. The light is going to bend when it goes from the air into the oil, and then it's gonna bend again when it goes from the oil into the water. Okay, so we just have to deal with the subsequent bending of light following Snell's law twice. So we're gonna use Snell's law once for each interface from N1 to N2, and then from N2 to N3, as I just said, right? Okay, so here we have Snell's law written out twice, okay? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and solve for theta two. Look how I do that, okay? I'm going to solve for theta two, from, you know, from this expression here in terms of theta one, all right? And I know the indices of refraction and I know theta one. So I have all my information, no unknowns. So I'm just using this equation, okay? With only a single unknown. And I find that it's 27.1 degrees. Great. All then I need to do is feed that information forward because this course is theta two. So then I'll use this second expression with only a single unknown being um, theta three and just solve for that last unknown with my known indices of refraction and the angle that I solve for at the begin with, and I get 30.1 degrees. Excellent. So again, just do it once and then feed forward that information to do it a second time. Okay, so 30.1 degrees. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, yeah, it does, right? Because there was a more dramatic decrease in the angle when it went from air to oil. So the angle you know, decreased significantly because it turned towards the normal. And then when it went from oil to water, it actually turned away from the normal because it went from higher to lower index of refraction, but not as, not, not as dramatic a change, only three degrees, okay? So the overall effect is still a decrease. It is going straighter than it was before in the air, straight down that is, okay? Now in part B, I simply want to find the path of light through the oil and then find out how many wavelengths fit. All right, so to do that, we're gonna consider the index of refraction a couple times. First of all, we're gonna consider this triangle here, okay? The length of the oil, that's the thickness of the oil, we know to be one millimeter, and I'm gonna call the path length P, okay? So then P is L over cosine of theta, all right? That of course would be theta two, all right? And so then L over cosine of theta two, the 27.1 degrees we found in part A, gives us a thickness, well, is that rather a path length of 1.12 millimeters, which of course makes sense. It should be longer than thickness. The hypotenuse is longer than the length of the side, okay? And then we just wanna find out how many wavelengths fit. So M sub lambda is the number of wavelengths. So that's gonna be the path length divided by the wavelength, but I need to divide by the wavelength in oil, not the wavelength in a vacuum, right? Otherwise, I would be dividing by a longer wavelength and I'd be underestimating how many wavelengths fit. So I have to then take the wavelength in a vacuum and divide by N, the refractive index of oil. And if I divide by n, then having the n in the denominator of the denominator brings it back up top. So then we see our numerator is just path length times index of refraction of oil. So that is our values up top. And then we're dividing by the wavelength of the light in vacuum. And we find then that that, that 3,230 wavelengths fit, okay? All right, very good. Okay, example five. A beam of light is instant upon a flat piece of glass at an angle of incidence of 37.2 degrees. Part of the beam is transmitted and part is reflected. What is the angle between the reflected and transmitted rays? So this is not a terribly complex problem, but I, I, 
I didn't want to have it be our first problem that involved refraction because it revolved, involves refraction and reflection, but still pretty straightforward. Here's the picture, right? So we have some incident beam. We've got our reflected beam and our transmitted or refracted beam, right? Because it is transmitted, it's going through the material, but it's refracted because of the change in index of refraction, okay? So then we want to find phi, just the angle between the two beams or the, between the two rays, okay? And what's nice here is you can really see the advantage of using the notation for reflection, having it be theta one and then theta one prime, because then it's clear that all theta ones come up top and then theta two is only once you actually go into a different medium, okay? Because sometimes you might see these as like, you know, theta i and theta r, which is fine as well. But I do think this notation is quite clear. So we want to use both of our light ray laws. Okay, so our first one just simply states that theta 1 prime must be equal to the instant angle. So still 37.2 degrees. And in order to find theta 2, the refracted angle, we're simply going to use Stoll's law, right? And I didn't write it out. I assume we've seen it quite a few times already, just recently. So I just simply jumped to solving for theta 2 using inverse sine. And then we find that the refracted angle is 23.8, certainly a number that makes sense because it's significantly smaller than 37.2. And then we just want to find phi, the angle between the two. We know that this is 180 degrees, so 180 minus theta 1 prime minus theta 2 should give us our angle. And it sure does, and it's 119 degrees. Okay? All right. Let's do another concept question. I think it's our last one. Okay. So all light rays into a glass prism is shown. Which is a possible path for the ray to the prism? So three out of the four are physically impossible. Only one is physically possible. And in order to determine which one it is, you only have to consider the law of refraction. No calculations, just the general rule. Pause the video if you need to, because I want you to have an answer here. Make sure you can figure out which one is the possible path of light. Okay, all right, so I assume that you've all thought of on your own. Let's take a look, okay? So here's the idea. We simply want to draw lines that are normal to the right so they got to be angled because i need to make sure that this is 90 degrees right so that's the idea is these little lines represent the normal direction okay and i did that because it, that makes for an easy visual check to find out if we have the necessary changes in theta because theta 2 needs to be smaller than theta 1 because it needs to bend towards the normal as it's gone from air to glass and then theta 4 has to be greater than theta 3 because it has to bend away from the normal as it goes from glass back to air. So that's what we have to check for. So which of those meet that criteria? Well, we look over here, theta two does not do a very good job. They, or case A, does not do a very good job because theta one and theta two look about the same, okay? All right, case B, right, we have, yeah, we do have a decrease. So theta two, you know, if you look at it, it is, it is noticeably smaller than theta one, but we don't have the necessary change in angle between theta three and theta four. They look about the same, see? There, was, there wasn't a significant increase from theta three to theta four. So we can cross that one out as well. And by the way, I've labeled alpha here because often when we talk about prisms, we talk about the apex angle because that will define the prism, okay? And often, you know, we, we, either it's an equilateral triangle or we just simply don't need the other angles, okay? If it's isosceles, all right? Um, yeah, and we're not gonna have odd shaped ones. No, unless all three angles were specified. And again, looking at, at C, we don't need to worry about it because theta 1 looks like it's about equal to theta 2. So that leaves D from process of elimination, but it actually does, in fact, work. Because if we look at theta 1 to theta 2, right, right there, indeed, there is a decrease, all right? So theta 2 is smaller, right? So that angle is smaller than the beginning angle. And then the, the only one that has this, theta 4 is clearly larger than theta 3. See? It's, you know, got noticeably bigger. So we definitely know it's D because theta 2 is less than theta 1 and theta 4 is greater than theta 3 check. All right, let's do our first rather involved example, one that involves a prism, okay? So light is incident on an equilateral glass prism at a 45 degree angle to one face, as shown in the figure, okay? And calculate the angle at which the light emerges from the opposite face, and the glass has an index of refraction of 1.54, okay? So yeah, that's the index of refraction of the material. There's our apex angle. Here we're calling it A instead of alpha, right? And we know theta one, right? We were told it's 45 degrees. Okay, so here it is, okay? So we're gonna consider this triangle, that's why I've highlighted it, but let's go through the steps. So first we wanna find theta two, okay? That one right there. The first refracted angle. We're gonna use Snell's law, all right? And again, since we know theta one, we can find it in a very straightforward manner. It's 27.3 degrees, okay? Less than 45, that checks out, okay? And also this glass is a pretty high index of refraction. And now we want to find the angle of incidence from the triangle formed by the two sides of the prism and the light path. So every time you have light go into something like a glass prism and then come back out, 
one of the tricks of solving these problems is you always have to relate the two internal angles, the two angles that are within the prism, okay? So one of them, of course, is, is a refracted angle. The other is an angle of incidence, okay? Because, you know, it's on its way back out of the glass. But the point is you have to relate these two. The best way to relate these two angles is some sort of geometry, okay? I guess that's the only way. And we're going to use it, we're always going to involve, it's always going to involve triangles, okay? So in this case, we're considering this green triangle. So if we consider these sides of the triangle, as well as the apex angle, then we can sum them up and say they have to sum up to 180 degrees, as for any triangle, okay? And we know it's an equilateral triangle, which tells us that A's got to be 60 degrees, the apex angle, okay? So that's the idea, all right? So I'm going to take this angle here, all right, which is equal to 90 minus theta 2. This angle right here is equal to 90 minus theta 3. So if I sum those two angles with the apex angle, they have to sum to 180, okay? So that means that if I just go ahead and solve and cancel out the 90s with the 180, then I find that theta 3 is just equal to the apex angle minus theta 2, which is just 60 minus 27.3, which is 32.7 degrees. Aha, we know theta 3. Excellent. Well, now that we know theta 3, it's simply a matter of using Snell's law again, all right, to find theta 4, all right? So that's what I'm going to do. We find theta 4, here's Snell's law, do our inverse sine expression. In this case, we're going to be um, solving for theta 4, so we're dividing by 1. So that means our leading number here is 1.54 rather than 1 over n. It's just n, in other words. And we get 56.2 degrees. All right? So pretty neat, right? And it's cool because actually it ends up, when it goes back into the light, notice that the angle is actually bigger relative to the normal than the original angle. All right? Okay. So let's do it again for an odd shape. All right? This is probably our most, most involved example. Okay? And this is our last of our type 2 problems. Our final type 3 problem, creating an image through refraction, is on the next page. And that's our last example. But example seven, okay? So let's take a look at the solution. Okay, so here it is. So here's the picture. There's a couple of triangles I want us to consider. All right, so there, we definitely want to consider this one here, all right, and this one that involves the actual angles of refraction and incidence within the glass, okay? So the block of glass with a index of refraction of 1.5 shown in cross section, surrounded by air, all right? A ray of light enters the block on its left face with incident angle theta 1. That's what we're actually solving for. We want to know theta 1. But here's something we know. It re-emerges into the air from the right, fo right face directed parallel to the horizontal. That little piece of information, parallel to the horizontal, actually tells us theta 4. So we know theta 4. we got to reason it out, right, looking at the picture, using some geometry. But once we can re uh, realize that we already know theta 4, then we can work our way backwards to find theta 1. Okay? So we're going to need to use Snell's law, twice, Snell's law twice, like in the previous example, and we also need to relate the two internal angles, theta 2 and theta 3, okay, using geometry of triangles. So we note that phi, that's this angle here, equals 180 minus 45. How do I know that? Well, I know that from this, this here, all right? So I know that this, because this is the normal direction drawn here, must make a 90 degree angle with the surface, this curved surface. I know this curved surface is 45 degrees relative to the horizontal. That means I know that this angle is also 45. And since this one's 90, this one's 45, that means that this angle is 45. And since this whole line is 180 degrees, right, it's a straight line, then phi must be 180 minus 45. So that tells me that phi is 135 degrees. Then I know that my angle of refraction and my angle of incidence within the glass plus phi all sum up to 180 because they form a triangle. That would be this triangle right here, okay? Okay, so that tells me that there's a relationship between theta 2 and theta 3 that says that they sum up to 45 degrees, right? And that's obviously just from subtracting 135 from both sides. Okay, and we also see that theta 4 is equal to 45 degrees from bisecting lines. Let me zoom in and quickly justify that, all right? So we know that if we have this line right here, and then we have the horizontal direction, and we know this pink runs parallel to the horizontal, we know that this 45 degrees must equal that 45 degrees, okay? Well, then we also then we know that theta 4 um, plus 45 degrees has to equal 90 degrees because, after all, it is the normal direction. So what does that tell us? Yep, tells us that theta 4 is also 45 degrees. Very good. Okay, so now we're going to consider Snell's law twice. Okay, we're going to co uh, consider it between theta 1 and theta 2 and between theta 3 and theta 4. Now, again, we're trying to isolate theta 1, trying to solve for theta 1, and that's what I'm doing here just with the math side. Okay, so I'm just going to rewrite this exp this version of Snell's law to solve for theta one, and I'm going to rewrite this one over here 
to set it up and solve for theta two, but it's gonna require a couple more steps. And notice I've already replaced theta four with 45 degrees, because it's a known value, okay? So I'm gonna, like I said about this one, that this expression for theta three and theta four, right? Now it's going to, um, it's only going to have one unknown because look what else I did. I got rid of theta three and I expressed it in terms of theta two, see? And the reason I did that is because now if I solve this equation, which only has a single unknown, for theta two, then I can substitute that back in over here, and there you go, we got our final answer, the initial angle, okay? Again, working backwards, all right? And the reason I was able to replace theta three with 45 degrees minus theta two is from the triangle that we formed with phi, all right? So it's just this result, solving for theta two, okay? All right, or rather, solving for theta three. Okay, but I do wanna to continue to isolate theta two, so that's all I've done here. I take, I divide both sides by n, right? So I'm just gonna have sine 45 degrees divided by n, I'm gonna take sine inverse of both sides, which just leaves me with what was inside the trig function. So I have 45 degrees minus theta two equals sine inverse of one over n times sine of 45. Then I'm just gonna rewrite this, subtract the sine inverse expression from both sides, add theta two to both sides. Then I got theta two all by itself. Now I can substitute that back into the theta one equation as I said I would. And so when we do that, when we take this whole expression for theta one and substitute it in, well, we get this. There it is, expressed more or less symbolically, but you know, with the 45 degree angles known. And then we finally plug in our relevant value of the index of refraction, that, that being n equals 1.5, and we got our initial angle, 25.8 degrees. Very cool, All right? We did it. Okay, so now let's look at our final example. So I wanna give a, a bit of explanation behind this. So this is an example where we're talking about an, an image being formed. Right? This idea that refracted light, since it's bent, means that things appear where, they, where they're not actually located. We know this because if you look inside of a fish tank, you know, fish appear magnified in a way and they appear to be located somewhere different than when you look from the top. You see it with, when it, with a straw and a glass of water, you see that effect of refracted light, okay? So those are images formed by refraction. We're going to get back to using an equation that really simplifies the idea of images formed by refraction. But here, we're just simply gonna use Snell's law, okay? Which I suppose is an equation in its own right, but do expect another approach down the line. Okay, so, but let's first do this one. A fisherman wishes to shoot a fish with a bow. The fisherman is standing on the bank of the water at a height of 2.6 meters, so h equals 2.6. Their line of, and their line of sight with the surface of the water makes an angle of 25 degrees, so theta is 25. The index of refraction of the water is 1.33. The fish appears to be directly on the line of sight. So the person right here, that's their eye, by the way, they look down and they see the fish. It looks like a direct path, okay? Okay? and the, um, that intersects the water, and it intersects the water, right? So that's, that's they know the distance to the water is 5.5 .5 meters, maybe because that's a, it's at the end of a pier of known length or something, right? So they know that distance. Furthermore, they know the actual depth of the fish because the fish is, say, at the bottom of the pool, and they know exactly how deep the pool is. They know the pool is 2.7 meters deep, okay? So the idea then is how far is the fish fish actually from the shore. And by the way, when I say how far, I'm only interested in its horizontal distance. Because of course, you know, we could find its overall distance because we know its depth. But here we just want to solve for its horizontal distance. This is the picture, okay? This is what we want to solve for in part A. We want X fish, okay? Because this dark version, this is the image of the fish. This is where the fish appears to be, okay? But the fish is actually located right here in this lighter, lighter gray graphic, okay? And that's because the light coming from the fish comes up to the interface between the water and the air and bends away from the normal. So even though here you might think, oh, the ray is coming down into the water, really the way to think about it is the ray is coming up out of the water because the source of light is the fish. Ultimately, the fish is a source of reflected light, but it's still a light source, reflected light from sunlight, right? But it's still a light source. So that light comes up to the water, bends away from the normal, okay? So that means that the relationship between what I labeled as phi two and phi one is defined using Snell's law, okay? So let's, let's work it out, okay? So we're gonna use Snell's law between the angles. We know phi one already because we know that this is 25 degrees, so phi one is just 90 minus 25, and we're just gonna solve for theta two. That's the angle down inside the water, and it ends up being 43 degrees. Excellent, okay? Good, all right? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna find this distance, which I call x2. That's the distance from the surface of the water to the actual distance to the fish. Okay, so if we set up that triangle, okay, then we can go ahead and solve for x2 and it ends up being 2.5 meters, okay? So that means the actual distance of the fish from the shore is just going to be x, the distance from the, the person to the, um, 
where the line of sight dips down in the water plus x2 that we solve for, right? So x plus x2. And so we again, we know that it was uh, 5.5 meters. So we simply add 2.5 to 5.5 and we get our eight meters. Okay, so the fish, fish is actually eight meters away. Now again, it appeared further away, okay? So if we had if we had go ahead go go ahead and solve for that, we would have had this triangle here, and we would have found that we would have found a greater value than eight meters, the apparent distance of the fish. Okay, but now that we know the true distance of the fish using the law of refraction, now we can aim our bow. So what angle do they want to actually aim at? Okay, well to consider that, consider this triangle here. Here we have that we're going to form a triangle that is this one here. Okay. So this triangle involves the depth of the water, the height of the person, and the over hypotenuse to where the actual fish is located, not its image, okay? So H plus D is one side of the triangle, X plus X2 is the other side of the triangle, okay? It's a right triangle. And of course, X plus X2 is none other than X fish, okay? So then we can go ahead using inverse tangent because we can use our opposite, opposite over adjacent definition of tangent to solve for that theta F, that's just theta F for final, all right? and it's 33.5 degrees, okay? And that is a steeper angle than it would be otherwise, right? Because otherwise, we would not have been aiming so steeply, okay? So, I mean, so obviously, right? Before, it was 25 degrees, see? It got steeper. It's more down than before. So again, if we'd aimed 25 degrees, we would have overshot and missed the fish. But by aiming a little bit down, a little bit closer to the shore, then the fish appears, we hit it dead on, with our 33.5 degrees. Okay, excellent. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully that makes sense of how we can use refraction to find the location of a true object based on the location of an image. All right, very well. I hope this lecture has been interesting and informative. Thank you so much for watching.